Hello everyone, my name is Kara Brown and I would like to welcome you to my participation in Chapter 4 of Woodstock where we are focusing on dialogue. For those of you who are not aware of what Woodstock is, it is an initiative that is facilitated by Robert Jones, the story detective, who I have a link to his channel down below. And he wanted to do an endeavor that brings writers from different walks of life and experience and different stages of their writing journey together to discuss a particular topic. And the really nice thing about it is that we all kind of approach it from a different angle, which has been very insightful for me um, as a writer. And if you take a look down below, I have a list of all the participants who are taking part in Chapter 4. And really a good selection here. I think Robert is doing a great job. If you have not seen the previous three chapters, please go Go check out his channel he does have playlists with all these videos on it and if you are looking to learn something about any topic that is really the place to go at this point so for those of you who have no idea who i am and you want to know why i'm qualified to give any kind of writing advice uh my name is kara brown i am an urban fantasy author and i also write uh, romance erotica under the name of Faye Black. I am frequently on a lot of live streams within the writing community and I have been professionally writing for about five years both creatively and academically. Uh, in regards to my published works I have uh, Queen of Swords and Silence who is published with Otherworld Inc and I have a number of short stories that are published as well. And I have been attending writing groups for about five years. Presently, I go to two. One is virtual and one is in person. The one that's been in person has been my five-year uh, attendee one. And we have a lot of different writers there as well who have been published for 20 years, who own their own companies. So I have seen and heard a lot on uh, various topics. So I just like to lay down that I've got a good foundation for this topic that we're going to dive into. And speaking of diving into, let's just do it. So. Uh, I'm going to talk about dialogue grammar. Um, if you're there, out there looking for people to talk about how to make like really fast paced dialogue or how to do a whole bunch of other stuff, um, those videos are out there. That video is not here. I'm going to focus on grammar, what it looks like, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about how to dress up your sentences if you are one of those individuals who does not like said. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit too. But before I dive into the errors that I frequently see, I do want to talk about the references that I do use so that way you guys don't think I'm just talking out of my butt. Um, these are the three resources. The self-editing on a penny is a new one that I really encourage anybody who is just trying to tackle editing for the first time. Very good info, great stuff in there. Um, edit The dialogue stuff in there is not very expansive and it's not very expansive in the Chicago Manual style. Both of those kind of talk about it for like a page, maybe two pages um, with various examples. But if you really want to see a lot of different examples from different mediums and all that, it's going to be How to Write Dazzling Dialogue by James Scott Bell. And under those books are going to be the page numbers of those volumes. So that way if you're just looking to know where exactly I'm looking at in these books, it's right there. I checked it before I made this video. The common errors I see are on the screen. Um, in two columns I have one that says don't do and then I have do this. Uh, one caveat that I am going to throw out is that some publishing houses have their own grammar rules and if you do not know what that means I'm happy to explain. Uh, depending on which publishing house that you go to they like all of their books to maintain a certain format and a certain style so when they go through the editing process with their in-house editors they're gonna have that format changed to match the overall house style that's what that's called um, but if we're talking about what usually happens in the Chicago manual of style um, what I have done here to make these changes is what you should sub submit your manuscript with and that's Anyway, let's just do that before I get off on a tangent. Um, so the first example right here is, uh, you are not my mom, he said, and then on the do this, I have the he, uh, the H and he actually lowercase. And the reason that it's lowercase is because this is referred to as a dialogue sentence. This entire passage right here is all actually one sentence. Even though there's an exclamation mark right here, our, you know, from school we are taught to go ahead and make sure that the next letter is going to be capital. You don't do that with a dialogue sentence. You write just like this. And the next one, uh, somebody is trying to add emphasis to a word and they do it with all caps. Chicago manual style, going to slap your hand about that. Don't do it. What they want you to do is use italics. Um, and you use italics to add emphasis to the words that you are saying. You also use it for foreign words and you also use it for thoughts, which I have on the bottom. Um, and then in the third example, you think you know me, which has the question mark and exclamation mark. I have seen this used and not used. It really depends on the publisher. Um, the Chicago manual style actually shies away from this. They don't want you to do this. This is considered a big boo-boo. Uh, but again, it's, it's being used in certain indie presses. so. Uh, 
kind of depends. Depends on your relationship with them, all that other stuff. Um, if you don't want to make this kind of, I don't want to call it mistake, if you don't want to make this choice, um, you can either use a better descriptor to explain that she's yelling or you can use a gesture to show it. So, and I'm going to talk about how to do that uh, a little bit later. Uh, the fourth one, which is my favorite, favorite pet peeve, and by favorite I mean it's not, is she pouted, comma, why are you so mean? So, I don't know about you, but when I make a face, unless my mouth is moving, my expression does not speak for me. Which is exactly what the sentence is actually saying. She pouted, comma, why are you so mean? Expressions don't speak like that. They may be nonverbal, they may convey meaning, but words are not coming out of your eyebrows. So, what you're going to do is you're going to say, she pouted, period, and then ask the question. Now, uh, on the very bottom here, I don't see this too frequently, but I'm just trying to cover all the bases. If you were having somebody think, but you put quotations around it, you're going to confuse your reader because quotations mean that that's speaking, even if you have the thought tag right after that. Instead, what you do is you remove the quotations and you just leave it all in italics like in this other example. Again, this does not come from me. This comes from Chicago Manual Style and from the Dazzling Dialogue book. I'm just trying to help you all out. But that's how you should submit your manuscripts to publishers when it comes to adding the dialogue grammar stuff. So I do have... I don't really have like a pony in this race as I like to say when it comes to the set is dead and only you said you will find individuals who do have these stances um, I am of the school thought that both are okay um, it kind of really depends I do know that there was a study uh, in regards to the using said in literary works and how often it should be used and all this other stuff and what researchers found is that uh, in books readers naturally gloss their eyes over said what they're really doing is using that to indicate who's talking so uh, where you run into some individuals who said using said is redundant and you should get rid of it my counter argument to that is then you should get rid of and the and it from books as well because those are also reoccurring small words that happen in book uh, there's nothing wrong with said as far as I'm concerned can it be a little tedious sometimes it can be um, and I have an example in the next slide about when that happens but if you're trying to get away with it, I would just encourage you to use descriptors. Uh, try to figure out if you want to use a gesture or an expression instead of using the word said. But whatever you do, do not just constantly replace said with other speech tags like exclaimed, yelled, questioned, stated. Um, and the reason that I'm telling you that is because the hard, doing those actually makes it harder for your reader to follow along because they have to pause and decipher what it is that you're trying to say and then apply it. And the last thing that you really want to do is make your readers work because the harder they work, the less they want to read, they're going to close the book. That's not what you want to do. Uh, and then here I have a couple of questions uh, that you can ask yourself about, well, when should I use said? And um, these are mostly self-explanatory, although I do want to point out uh, the first one, which is, will the reader know who is speaking? If you have three people or more taking part in a conversation, you have to constantly either use said or some other indicator about who is speaking because that is a very quick way for people to get confused. And I've never read a passage with three or more people having a discussion where if a speech tag wasn't used, people got confused about who's talking. So um, if you have any questions about the rest of these, I got a comment section. Feel free to ask. I'm more than happy to dive into those answers for you. But with that said, we're moving on. So I thought I was kind of a... This, I'm, I'm on both schools of thought when it comes to do you use said, do you use other things. And what I have here are two examples from text that I have written. Um, and you can kind of take a look at them and see how I've either work said or a gesture or something else in there. Um, on the very bottom, uh, I have Love's Eyes and Wakes by James and first name basis, like we're friends. Um, but and I know from reading Love's Eyes and Wakes is that said is used all the time. That is the only thing that is used. There's no other descriptors, no other thing. It's just, even if you know that there's just two people in a room, it always says so-and-so said, so-and-so said, so-and-so said. And when I read the book, that wasn't like very distracting for me. But when I listened to the audiobook, that's when it got a little tedious for me. So I'm just, I'm sharing where it can be tedious and where it can't be. But um, very curious about your thoughts in regards to said, not trying to start some big debate or anything but I just think that listening to other people and their take on it is really intriguing and feel free to share your thoughts with me. So my writing wife likes to say this phrase where I need you to dress up your dialogue and what she's really asking for are more descriptors to help kind of give an emphasis to what's being said, set the mood, make the pacing a little more, kind of flesh out the scene. Um, and what I've done here is I have created multiple examples um, of the same 
scene that's going on, but I've changed the tone of the words by the descriptors that I am using. And in the first one, I basically just took like the, the dialogue and I switched it. Um, I, usually when I add descriptors like that, I put them in the front if I feel like they're needed at that moment or, or I put them in the back. It kind of depends on what you're doing with your writing piece at that time. Um, but yeah, so you can go ahead and pause the video and take a look at these different examples and see how the descriptors basically change the tone of what's being said. Um, this is a great thing to do. I would really encourage everybody to do this as a creative exercise. Um, and one thing that maybe you can do is just take like a script from a movie and add the descriptors in there. I, I actually really like that exercise. I think it's a lot of fun. And see how changing the descriptor changes the tone of the words. So food for thought, let's move on. And, and by moving on, I meant to say that that was the end of the presentation. Um, thanks so much for coming over and hearing what I have to say. I hope you guys found this really useful and I hope you guys really enjoy the other videos that are coming out. Feel free to go check out uh, Story Detective's channel. He usually has a playlist where he puts all the videos together so that way you can just kind of sit and listen to folks. I am going to be honest, it is a pretty lengthy sit down. It's probably going to take you a couple of days, but the information that people share is freaking gold. So, um, that's pretty much going to be the end of it. I thank you guys so much for coming and hanging out and hear what I have to say. And I will talk to you all real soon or as soon as I can. Be safe. Wash your hands. And yeah, bye.